And we are recording. So welcome, Andy Try, Craig Heiger. Please tell us about bear management, ecology, and hunting in Minnesota. Sure, thanks, James. Uh, so I'm Andy Try. I'm the acting bear project leader for the state of Minnesota. And uh, I'm, we kind of stand with this information on the shoulders of giants because we've we're, we've been a lucky state and we've had an active bear research program here since the 1980s. So quite a lot that we've learned over the years. Um, so uh, bears in general uh, up through the 1960s in Minnesota were a bounty species, meaning they were classified as a varmint and they had no closed season. Um, in 1971, they became a game species, which formalized the hunting season and regulations around them. And then in 1982, as the bear hunting tradition had been going for about 10 years and was becoming more formalized uh, with a desire to raise the bear population size, we instituted the first in the country's quota system on bear hunting licenses, and it's been that way ever since. Um, the gentleman on the left-hand side of the screen here is the largest recorded live weight of a black bear in the state of Minnesota. Now, I will give a caveat here that we don't have live check stations anymore uh, in person, so this record has been broken anecdotally. Um, but we don't have an official check station. So this bear was 687 pounds up near Mizpah, Minnesota. And so with bears, there's a lot of different sources of mortality that happens. Um, they can be hit by cars, they can be killed by hunters, they can be shot as a nuisance um, when they're causing damage to property or, um, or agriculture, or they can die in natural mortality. Um, but in general, um, hunting mortality is the most dominant um, type of mortality that bears face in Minnesota. Um, in a lot of the places with a lot of um, uh, public ground that's available, about 80% of the bears die due to hunting. And then we have a couple other study sites we've had over the years where hunting is not allowed or the bears have had bright orange ear tags. And even there, hunting is the largest source of mortality. Um, this happens because the bears leave those protected refuges and end up getting shot during the hunting season. The, the good thing about this is that hunting mortality is the one thing that we can control in a varying environment. And so if we need to change the trajectory of the population, uh, we can do so through changing the number of tags that are issued. Uh, one cool bear fact about Minnesota um, bear 56 is the oldest known wild bear that has um, died due to natural causes. Very few bears actually die of old age. They're often sh shot long before they reach that stage. Um, and the only known um, wild death that we have had, um, or I should say the only known death at old age of any of our radio collar bears that we've had over the years, and um, we're well over a thousand bears collared. Um, generally, for bear biology, the weight is highly variable. It varies from spring to winter time. Um, the bears in springtime coming out of the dens have exhausted their fat reserves and they're at their lowest weight. Um, they stay at a relatively moderate weight through the summer and then really ramp up their eating in the fall to pack on the pounds for hibernation. Um, and so that results in a huge variation of weights. Um, from year to year and from size and age classes. And so a small female up in far Northern Minnesota might be 150 pounds, whereas you might have 500, 600, there's even been reports of 800 pound males in the state. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the bears, <laughs> bears when they're hunted have this thing called ground creep. And so um, what happens is the, the bear hunter, um, sees a bear at the bait, they get ready, they take their shot, looks like a massive bear. And then as they get closer, um, that, that, uh, that bear tends to shrink in size. And it's, it's partially due to just that bear fever, the excitement of having a bear that you have an opportunity to take. Um, but in general, bears look bigger than they actually weigh. It's, it's just due to their frame and the, the, 
fluffiness of their, their coats in the fall as they're getting ready for winter. Um, they eat a variety of foods, but almost everything is plant-based. And so in the spring, they'll eat clover and um, jack in the pulpit and wetland plants that transitions into ants and insect broods as the summer progresses. And then uh, they switch to fruits and nuts, the more traditional bear diets in the summer. Um, females don't reproduce until they're five. That's the longest time um, that it takes for any of the large game mammals to reproduce in the state mm -hmm. of Minnesota. So it can, um, it just takes a long time for a cub to be able to have cubs of her own. And um, the population dynamics are much slower um, in bears than they are, say, with deer or even moose or elk. Um, litter size is three on average, 2.6 statewide. So three is more common than two, but um, litter size can be all the way up to five. And we did have a report of a bear with six cubs uh, in Crow Wing County about three years ago, um, confirmed with a photo, but that's the largest we've ever heard of. Those cubs are born in January. They stay with their mom for a full year and then another six months and they're kicked out at about 18 months of age when it's breeding season. Um, mom will chase the males off and the males will leave. And then the female yearlings get to stay in a small portion of the home range of their mother. Basically, they'll section off a little bit and say, hey, our, this is your own area. And they'll kind of have a honeycomb of home ranges across the landscape. This is that dietary diversity that I mentioned before. And so basically it starts off with vegetation, then there's animal matter in the middle. Um, ants and wasp larvae are, are big food sources for them until the berries show up. Um, occasionally they'll take a fawn or two when fawns first drop in those first couple days when they're, they can't run very fast. But after the first few days, it's just not worth it for the, the bear to take a fawn. Um, in July, the sarsaparilla berries show up. That's the first berry species that bears eat. And then they'll switch to raspberries, cherries, and um, some of the other fruits like June berries in the summertime. And then as they get closer to hunting season and the fall, then their dietary diversity tightens again. And it's essentially hazelnuts, acorns, and dogwood that are the three key food species for the fall. Um, the where for bear hunting. So in Minnesota, any of those shaded areas are where you can find bears. That's what we're considering bear range. There is a small population of bears down in the far southeastern part of the state, um, but we figure there's probably less than 20 individuals down there. Um, bears are widespread across the state and their, their population or their range seems to be expanding. Um, you can find them now on the north end of the Twin Cities. There's even a report of a female with cubs near Elm Creek Park in the Twin Cities, which is a Three Rivers Park District Reserve um, this last summer. And so the population dynamics vary across an area that large, and they really vary with food. Um, areas with quite good food, like that edge of bear range, this is kind of a stretch from Roseau down to Bemidji and Brainerd and then across to Hinkley or so. Um, that's kind of the most productive area of the state for bear reproduction. And then it, it's uh, less so in kind of the heart of bear range. And that's just due to the food conditions, better foods on the edge of bear range. Um, but you can find bears everywhere in the state. We even had some reports of a bear down near Pikestone in the last couple of years. Uh, the when and where to hunt. So this year, bear hunting starts, or bear baiting starts on the 13th. It's always about two weeks before the season. And pretty regularly, the bear hunting season starts on the 1st of September and goes until mid-October. Um, there were a few years in the past where it was back in the last week of August, but in general, it's been pretty fixed around the 1st of September. Um, the biggest bears in the state, if you really are after a huge bear, um, they can be found in northwestern Minnesota or along that transition zone from farmland into forest, basically anywhere where there's good agriculture and uh, lots of oak forest. So when you're thinking about bear hunting, um, there's a couple of things to consider. And so the first part is the where. And so there's 
uh, a number of bear management units in the state. You can go on the recreation compass. That's the best tool. So if you have an idea for where you want to hunt, or if you want to explore some of the public lands um, on which to hunt, um, the recreation compass will tell you what bear zone it's in and public versus private land, that sort of thing. Also, you can look at the paper maps or you can go online on the DNR's bear hunting website for information there. Um, and your first major choice is quota or no quota. And so the quota is a limited number of permits and has a fairly long wait time. Um, it's about three to six years, depending on where you go. The place that you have to wait the longest to hunt is bear zone 45. That's about a six year wait. Um, but in the quota zone, there's far less competition and much higher success rates. And so last year, given a drought, we had one of the highest success rates on, um, on record. And so 60% of the bear hunters in the quota area uh, got their bear. That's some of the highest success rates in the entire country. And it's just uh, a competition thing. There's more bears available for a limited number of hunters. It's a high quality hunt. Um, to hunt the quota zone, you have to apply in May. Um, this year, the 7th was the deadline. And then uh, the surplus tags, those are tags for people that were drawn, but they did not buy, go on sale the 1st of August. And so this is kind of a free for all, and it's just best to get in line at an ELS station. And if you're not the first person in line, go find another ELS station, because all of these tags basically go in the first three minutes. And so if you're not first in line, chances are you won't get pulled on the surplus tags. Um, area 451, which is in the southeastern corner or southwestern corner of this map, um, that's a bear zone that's technically in the quota zone, but has an unlimited quota. And so you can buy those as soon as surplus sales go, um, go into effect and there's, you buy them over the counter. Um, additionally, when you apply, if you are interested in helping a wildlife manager take a nuisance bear, um, you can apply to wherever you want to bear hunt as your first choice. And your second choice can be this Area 88. It's not a real bear management unit, um, but it gets your name added to a list and they'll call you if they have a nuisance issue and they're willing to take a bear. Um, in addition, you can apply to Area 99. That's not a real bear management unit either. That's basically just buying a preference point. So if you know you're going to be not available in September to hunt bear, you can just put in for a preference point and you'll still get one for that year. Um, if you want to hunt in the no quota, that's basically anywhere else in the state that doesn't have a number, with the exception of the uh, Red Lake Reservation up in the northwestern part of the state. There's no bear hunting there. Um, but basically everywhere else, you can buy these tags over the counter. Uh, there's fewer bears that available and there's a lot more hunters, but in general, um, these hunters find bears. And so uh, nearly half of the hunters in the state hunt in that no quota zone. That's the, um, the purple line. It's basically increased every single year since about 2000. And uh, it's quite popular. There's a number of big chunks of public land to the north of the Twin Cities, like Changuatana State Forest, um, that have a lot of bear hunting intensity and something like uh, 90 to 100 bear baits per square mile are in that area. Um, despite that, about a third of the statewide harvest is in the no quota zone, so folks are less successful, um, but they can hunt every year, so it's uh, less of a, you take that trade off, I should say. And, and the, a question we get a lot is, why are there so long waits for hunting in the quota zone? And so um, the long story short is, Back in the early 2000s, we were at a population peak and it was too high for um, society to tolerate. There was lots of bear damage, lots of nuisance issues, and we as an agency decided to issue a lot more tags. Um, we were really successful and in fact, the population decline got ahead of us and we basically lost half of our bears in a 10, 15 year period. And so we have, um, come out of the bottom and are slowly increasing in the quota area, but because it takes five years for bears to reproduce, um, we're really hesitant to issue drastic increases in the, the bear hunting quota permits until our population modeling and our data suggest bear population is on a good 
solid um, increase. And so for the quota zone, that's this top line. Essentially, it declined, has been stable, and then is very slowly increasing over the last couple of years. However, in the no quota, the bear population has been essentially increasing this entire time. And so that is another reason why there's a lot more hunters, or half the hunters are in the no quota as well, and they still are finding bears. Um, about a quarter of the hunters every single year are new bear hunters. This is really good because um, bear hunting is an expanding um, expanding activity in the state of Minnesota. Not all species have, um, have had that uh, sort of renewed vigor. And uh, if you've never hunted bear bears before, it's a good idea to uh, attend one of our bear hunting clinics. Um, you can either um, go to one of those or you can contact um, the telephone number above, that's the training center, uh, or you can go online and they'll ship you a USB flash drive with those hunting clinic slides um, if you're not available to uh, attend one of our clinics. Furthermore, there's lots of information online um, lots of baiting and bear hunting blogs and forums, as well as lots of really good information um, on YouTube for how to do this. Generally, if you're going to hunt bear in Minnesota, you're, you're going to need to bait just because everybody else is. And so if you don't have bait, chances are the bears you would be hunting are going to be pulled to um, other baits. Our, our GPS collar information shows that about 90% of all of our collared bears in a given year hit baits. And so it just makes sense to do this if you want to have a chance at shooting a bear. Um, the bait stations have really specific regulations, which we'll get into. Those regulations can be found on the website. And if you're going to uh, hunt bears, you have to hit them early and you have to hit them hard. 70% um, of the statewide harvest happens in that first week and often whenever the first weekend is. And then 80% of the bear hunting is done by the second week of the season. 92% of all the bear hunting is done in the first month. So basically anybody who's hunting in October um, are those that didn't have a chance to hunt or those that are holding on and have passed bears and are waiting for a big bear. Um, generally, you're looking for dense cover. And so you want to find, uh, put your, your hunting stand, we'd prefer, or it's a better option to do an elevated stand, but um, you want to put them in a forest opening near dense cover, close to water, and where you find those natural fall foods. Think food, water, shelter, just like any other hunting any other species. Um, and then use game trails as your guide. Bears take the path of least resistance, and often you can follow these game trails and find scat, or um, which is a fancy name for poop, or um, uh, prints, or um, signs that bears have knocked over vegetation and eaten berries, that sort of thing. And so um, use those game trails to your advantage. Bears don't have very good eyesight, but they're quite wary. So when you're putting up your stand, think about and look at where the prevailing winds are coming from. You wanna be downwind of that bear so you don't, um, you don't spook them off before you have a chance. Um, and then scout your areas early and often. Um, Bears in the fall, once the fall food hits, um, they migrate in the state of Minnesota. So about half of the females migrate and about two thirds of the males migrate. So for, for bears in Grand Rapids, which is where I work, often they head down towards Brainerd or um, up into the bogs near, um, near Red Lake. And so like 150 miles for a male bear migration is no big deal. For females, it's closer to about 40, 50 miles. But essentially, the bears that you're scouting for in July are not the same bears that are going to be there around September 1st. And so um, just keep that in mind that the scouting before the season is really critically important to make sure that you're hunting. Um, you know that there are bears in the areas where you're hunting. You can use trail cameras, but just be aware of the regulations on some of those public lands that you might put them on. WMAs will have different regulations than the Forest Service. And then about 10% of the hunters in the state in any given year use guides to help them with their hunts. And so we have licensed outfitters in the state of Minnesota. Those can be found on the website if you choose to use one. Um, don't shoot collared or radio tag. Uh, collared or ear tag bears 
those are what we use to help set the quotas and learn more about what's happening with reproduction and survival in the state. And so we don't get that reproductive data until bears are on the ear multiple years. And so if you can pass on an ear tag bear, that would be ideal. Generally, if it has large cattle style ear tags, it's got a collar on it, even if you can't see it. The collars are black and with the bear's head in the barrel or the bait pile, sometimes it's hard to see. And so um, we, we ask you to please pass on those. If you happen to, to pick up any um, ear tag bears on your trail camera, please shoot me an email with those photos. We're interested to see where our bears go. Um, in addition, it's illegal to shoot cubs. And so be really careful when you pull up on a, on a bear um, that you know what you're shooting at. Once you get your bear, you have to register your harvest within 24 hours and submit a tooth sample to us by the 1st of November. Um, it's best just to take the teeth out immediately while the, the body's still warm and put them in a tooth envelope so you don't forget. Uh, failure to do so can result not only in a fine, but it'll prevent you from entering the lottery the following year. Um, and you can pick those tooth envelopes up at any bear registration station. Um, not all of the big game stations are bear registration stations. They're real specific. So just make sure to plan ahead and check the list on our website for the regulations. Um, there's different costs for residents versus non-residents of licenses, um, but there's a, also a breakdown between adults and youth and the prices are right there. Um, annual limits, you're allowed two, two bears per year, um, one adult bear in the quota zone and one adult bear in the no quota zone. You need a license for each zone that you wish to hunt. And then Craig will take over from here, giving you an idea of what gear you might want to have. Hey, Sandy. Um, I'm Craig Kiger, Shooting Sports Coordinator for Fish and Wildlife Outreach. And um, I've been a bear hunter. I was just making some notes here for eight seasons. I've hunted um, the Squaw Lake area, the Grand Rapids area, and the Hibbing area. I've hunted on uh, nuisance tags. I've hunted with two guides and uh, several times by myself. And the very first time I ever bear hunted was back when you could buy the license over the counter. And um, a friend, they kept seeing bears at their place. And so they invited us to come out. And we didn't know anything about bear baiting or um, so it was, it was a failure in seeing a bear or harvesting a bear. But every time we went out, we learned a little bit more. Um, I've got two bears to my name. Um, I find it very exciting to, to bear hunt and the meat is very, very good. So let's run through some of the gear. Um, doesn't require any special equipment, but an elevated stand um, is, is pretty much ideal. Um, it does entail a lot of legwork. Uh, you're going to start baiting and, um, you know, you're allowed three baits per license that you register with the DNR. And you're going to go out and you're going to have activity at maybe one bait. And um, so you got to go back and check numerous times to see if those baits are being active and replenishing the, the bait there. You don't need a special firearm. Bears are, are big, heavy animals, bigger than deer, but the standard old 3030 would work just fine uh, for bear hunting along with the other ones as well. Uh, if you're a shotgun hunter, your 12 gauge slug is going to be a very adequate bear getting gun, too. Don't forget archery or muzzleloader. Um, a bear license allows you to hunt with any legal. Uh, piece of equipment so you can get out and use what you normally would use or try something a little bit different. Scent control is going to be very important. Um, I usually would uh, bring some camouflage netting or use some of the local uh, bows and help conceal me in that stand. Um, make sure you're wearing gloves because the flash of your your white hands is going to be a signal to that bear that something else is going on. And of course, we're going to have lots of different flying insects at that time. Um, 
one of the things that I would always do is put on the same bug repellent every time I went into the bait station. So the smell of the bug repellent just became part of the site. Um, I also came up with a little bottle of um, licorice flavoring and um, glycerin, and I would mix those two together and I would spray that around the site to help cover my scent that was there. Head nets, I can't stress that enough. Um, having mosquitoes buzz around you and your eyes and your ears um, is pretty distracting. And then just your everyday equipment that you would take in the field for any type of hunt. Uh, a good sharp knife to field dress your bear. Um, you know, rope to help position. Uh, I wouldn't really drag my bear. I would probably put it on a sled or on a cart if we could get a cart back to the site because we don't want to rub that hide. That's part of the reason why we're out there trying to harvest the bear. Um, I always bring um, latex gloves or rubber gloves to do the field dressing. It keeps me cleaner. Um, I like that. And anything else. You know um, that you'd use for field dressing animal. Uh, I bring zip ties so I can zip tie the um, the vent opening to prevent any loss of contents in the cavity and possibly contaminate my uh, my bear meat. And then have a a good map or aerial photo of your area uh, GPS. I've got my cell phone so I get maps on that and uh, you know. A, a source of fire, you know, if I got to spend the night out in the woods, I want to have have that too. Um, I can't tell you a camouflage pattern that's better than anyone else, but just something to help break up your outline. And um, a good pair of boots might be rubber boots because they help control the scent, um, but they're going to get warm, you know, and sometimes you might cross a, a lowland area that you need rubber boots to get in there. So I'd recommend that. Next slide, please, Andy. So, as I mentioned before, you can have three baits. You got to register them all online. Baiting is going to start here on the 13th of August this year. So, the reason for pre presenting this program now is to help get you guys uh, a little bit more aware and a little bit more excited about going out there. And legally, they have to be at least 100 yards apart. And and I would recommend farther just for. Um, respect of the other hunters that are out there. Uh, no meat with bones, uh, no animal carcasses uh, from mammals with 25% intact carcass, uh, no trash, no solid waste type stuff, just the food stuff. Uh, common bear baits, I've used sweets like donuts, um, old pastries. I've used dog food with old cooking grease and mix that up and that's kind of how I start my, my bear bait. Um, and then trail mix, fruits, nuts. If you can find a um, commercial supplier that has that kind of stuff, um, you know, there's a lot of protein in the, the trail mix stuff for the bears, so they really tend to, to like that. Um, avoid chocolate, especially dark chocolate, because it can be lethal to bears. And uh, it's illegal in some states, but not yet in Minnesota, but we don't want to make our bears sick or, or have them die from eating our bait sites. Uh, commercial suppliers are out there, but start calling early so you can get on uh, their list and they can accommodate your needs. Um, one year we bought five gallon drums of uh, cherry pie filling and that was pretty good. I've also done some um, baits where you, you know, heat up the bait at home and it, it smelled like Sunday dinner in the house. And I had to tell my wife, no, this was just for the bears. So kind of keep that in mind. I've done a couple of burns where uh, I put honey um, or, or marshmallows and strawberry gelatin and uh, burnt that. You get a nice plume of smoke and the bears hopefully would find that. Next slide, please. So you got to remember to to sign your um, bait site, and it says here at least six by ten inches. Uh, we'd always find some scraps of wood. Uh, you'd have the license 
these name and address or driver's license number. Um, if your uh, MNDNR number, you can put that on there. And you can put bait out for your friend, but you just have to have it signed with their information. Um, look for game trails and bear sign, tracks and scat. Uh, you know, when you find a uh, pile of bear scat, it's going to have seeds and berries um, in it. You're going to know what it is right away. Um, usually the larger diameter scat is going to be a bigger bear. Um, I try to set up a, like a cubby, like I'd do if I was trapping. Uh, it's a 90 degree um, platform of logs so that the bear has to go in there. And I position that so that when the bear goes in, he's going to position himself for a good shot. Um, keeps him at the bait longer, um, provides more of an ethical shot. I've also used uh, small burlap sacks that we wired up so the bear had to be, you know, be able to reach five feet to uh, get to the bait. Um, I dug pits and put logs across so the bear has to come in and pull those logs away, uh, keeps them there at the site longer. I've never used the drums, but they're legal on private land and there's no surcharge. Uh, if you do want to use a drum on public land, you got to pay a $5 charge per drum. Uh, and you can do that anywhere you buy your bear license. So, and there's a nice picture of what those uh, cow ear tags would look like on a bear. The next slide, please. Bears are most active before sunrise and after sunset. That first part of September, it's usually quite warm and they're wearing a full fur coat with probably four inches of, of fat built up and it's hot. They don't move a lot until the evening temps start to drop. Um, they have excellent sense of smell. It's 100% greater than humans. And um, 125 to 250 pound is an average bear. A 400 pound bear is enormous. And like Andy said early, ground shrinkage uh, is quite common. You know, you see this great big round bear come in and you shoot it. And when you get to it, it's like somebody let all the air out of your bear. The hairs lay down and they, they just seem much smaller. Um, a big bear's belly will, bear's belly will tend to protrude towards the ground more. And um, if you're after a, a truly big bear, uh, there's substantial daylight between the bear's midsection and the ground, pass it up. It's probably a younger bear. Take a look at the face of the bear. And if the ears appear to be close together towards the top of its head, it's probably a younger bear. The, uh, the other picture shows a much more mature bear and the ears tend to appear to be on the sides of the head. And uh, that's a, an indication of a much more mature bear. So next slide, Andy. So bears at the bait. Take a minute, calm yourself down and look for that good shot. Look for ear tags. Does it have a collar on it? Make a judgment on the size of the bear. Shooting cubs are illegal and wait to see if it's a female with cubs. If so, try to pass it up. I used to leave a five gallon bucket that I would carry the bait in at the bait site and use that to help judge the size of the head and how tall the bear was. Uh, I had a cub come in one time that literally fit into the five gallon bucket after he tipped it over and it's like, I wish I would have had a camera back then to record that. Um, if it's your desired bear, you know, line up for a vital shot. Wait till um, they put that front leg forward. It's going to expose more of that heart lung area. And if you notice the picture, that heart sets just a little bit further back than it does on a white tail. And uh, put your round through there and give that bear 20, 30 minutes to expire and take up that trail. And bears, like I said before, they got four inches of fat on them. Some of that fat can slide down and plug up your entrance and exit hole, and it may not bleed externally, it may bleed internally. And you're gonna have to use a lot of your wood skills 
uh, determine did that bear go down this path or did he go down this path? And uh, that's where it comes in handy to maybe have a, a second person that's willing to come out and help you look for that bear and recover that bear. Once recovered, you're gonna to wanna to remove the entrails um, as soon as possible. And when you get home, you're gonna start the skinning and processing of that bear as soon as possible to avoid spoilage. Um, gotta get that temperature in the meat down. So a lot of times I'd bring a cooler with me with frozen gallon milk jugs and start that cooling process immediately. Uh, field dressing the bear up to about the, the sternum and then I could pack that cavity with, with ice jugs to help bring down that temp. Okay, Andy, next slide, please. So handling the bear meat and taking the tooth sample, uh, it field dresses just like any other big game animal. Uh, try to keep the hair side of the skin blood free so you're not giving your taxidermist extra work. Uh, when you make that incision for field dressing, you know, kind of lay out that, that line from the vent to the sternum so that it's nice and straight. If you get it off to one side when they lay your bear rug out, it's not going to look right. Um, it's skin your bear with uh, and leave the paws. Um, it's, it's a difficult thing and it takes some special tools to to skin turn those paws. Remove the fat layer from the carcass. Um, I've, I've had really good luck with good tasting bear meat, but I've always taken all the fat off that I could get off. And some people might wanna render that down and use it for uh, lard or cooking, baking, uh, making pie crust out of. That'd be kind of an interesting thing to do. So in here, we're talking about splitting the carcass so you can get it into a cooler or break it down into quarters so you can fit it into your fridge or freezer overnight. It's not gonna freeze solid, but it's gonna help take the, the heat out of that meat and give you a better product in the end. Um, it says uh, the key is to get the meat cool as quickly as possible. And I think if you start with the gallon frozen milk jugs and finish it up by putting it in a, a cooler freezer um, as soon as possible, um, you know, you're gonna have good quality stuff. It says consume the meat within a few months. Uh, bear meat is similar to pork in that. Um, you wouldn't keep pork for a year in your freezer. So use the bear meat up. And we would cut steaks and do a lot of grinding meat. We'd make um, some bear sticks and there's different flavoring that they can put in there uh, from spicy to mild. Pull that tooth as soon as you possibly can. Fill out the information and get it in your mailbox on the way home. And, you know, if, if an accident happens and you shoot a uh, tagged or collared bear, give Andy a call right away. Uh, most collared bears have a heart monitor that's just under the skin, so we'd like to recover that as well so we can uh, see what that bear's uh, heart rate was doing through his life. And the next slide. So bear meat can have uh, trichinosis and um, it 145 degree minimum temp uh, through the entire piece of meat. Uh, I, I tease uh, James a little bit about boiling his steaks, but the sous vide method of, of using the warm water to, to cook your meat, it comes out very tender and it, it's got a good flavor to it. Um, it says freezing for 30 days will not kill that bug. And CDC showed study 41 out of 84 total cases uh, reported in America between 2008 and 2012 were from bear meat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it says heavy doses of antibiotics will cure the symptoms diarrhea, nausea, muscle pain, weakness, even nervous system and heart problems. But the larva cysts will remain in your muscle tissue. So cook that bear meat thoroughly and be able to enjoy it. Um, and if you ever feel like you might have been exposed to it, seek the medical attention. 
So next slide, Andy. So that's it. Um, we're open to questions. So if you wanna go to your Q&A section and type in some questions, uh, Andy's number's up on the screen. We can uh, find that out. Yeah, and I'll um I'll step back in here. I'll be uh I'll be serving up y'all some questions. Um, Andy, if you could put your contact information in the chat while I get some of these questions lined up, I think that will help. So if people have any, if they want to be able to get a hold of you, um, that'll be helpful. So, um, thanks to everybody who's been putting in questions. We've gotten several over in the in the Q and A. So I'm just going to start at the top and and work our way down. Um. Question, Andy. You know what the was Bear fifty six. Was that a sow? Do you know? Yep, that was a sow that uh, we collared her when she was about seven back in I think nineteen eighty or so, and then followed her the rest of her life. She had cubs up until about age twenty five, and then was dry after that. So she had basically no reproduction for fifteen years. Um, and if you want to read more about her. Uh, you can go to our website and look up the Conservation Volunteer Magazine. There's an article called The Shy Bear, which is all about her and her life. Awesome. Um, the next two questions are pretty related and they're from the same uh, viewer. Um, can you discuss some of the pros and cons of baiting? Um, specifically, some studies are suggesting that baiting may adversely impact population reduction objectives. Um, and not all states allow it. You know, wh what are some of the decisions that go behind allowing uh, baiting here in Minnesota? I know bear hunting varies from state to state, and some states do some things that other states don't. And then closely related to that is, do you have any tips for a hunter that wants to hunt without bait? Sure. Uh, so we'll start with the regulations part. And so I've worked in a number of states across the country um, on bears. I've worked most recently before this in um, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and West Virginia. And so they had the whole gamut of different regulations. And so some states allow baiting, others allow dogs, but no baiting. And some states offer dogs and baiting, and some offer none. And so a lot of the reasons why the regs are the way they are is that the decision was made early on and there's been just tradition um, to, to keep it that way. And so early on when the, when the bear regulations were initially being um, set, uh, there was a decision made to allow baiting because it allows uh, a hunter a better opportunity to harvest the bear um, than they would just sitting and stalking. Uh, just because how dense our forests are and it yeah. there's a lot of the state that's kind of emergent wetland and so it, it's, it can be really hard to hunt that way. Um, there was a decision on when Joe Alexander was the commissioner about what do we allow dogs or not and due to a number of issues including trespass issues uh, Minnesota opted not to allow dogs um, for bear hunting and so um, that's that's why we have continued to, to offer bear hunt or bear baiting. Um, the benefits to the population when we're recovering a bear population is that if females are eating at baits outside of shooting hours, that extra bump of calories might allow them to have pregnancy at a um, that that might not have taken due to natural food conditions. And so, um, if they can get to the baits and not be shot they often are in better shape than they would be if foods are poor. Um, conversely, if you're trying to reduce your bear population, baiting is super effective because you can, it, it, your opportunity to target and, and harvest a bear is much higher than it would be for spotting and stalking. Um, if you don't wanna use bait, that's totally all right. Um, then you gotta think more like a bear. And so you wanna find those areas with abundant natural foods and target those areas heavy. Um, if you're in the central part of the state, anywhere where there's really good oak production near an ag field is a good place to start. If you're farther north where oak is more rare, then you wanna try to find hazel patches with a lot of hazelnuts, or if you can find oak, that's the place where I would be hunting. Excellent, very, very cool. Um, doo -doo -doo. So our next question, uh, surplus tags, are they on sale August 1st or August 4th? 
uh, let me, I can double check that here. Uh, we haven't changed the dates. It's the normal traditional date that it is every year. That may have been a mistake on my part. Okay. Um, let me see. Well, uh, when he's answering that, why don't we just jump down to the 308 question? Okay. Um, I would use 165 well, to 180 green board. Craig, uh, restate the question because I don't think everybody can see the question. Oh. It says, what weight and type of bullet would you suggest for a 308? And I would um, go with a heavier grain bullet, 165 to 180 grain. If I was gonna shoot copper ammo, um, the 165 is gonna act more like a 180 grain bullet and 180 grain bullet's gonna act more like a 200 grain bullet. It's gonna give you deeper penetration. The bullet's gonna hold together. Um, so either, Either going with copper with um, 165, 180, or go to uh, a lead bullet. But remember, if you're using lead out in the field, animals could feed on that entrail pile and pass that lead along to them. So we, we recommend using the copper bullets for anything that you plan to use for the table. Nice. Um, surplus tags go on sale at noon on August 4th. Um, Andy, can military preference be used for unsold for surplus tags? Uh, I I think it's just whoever shows up and is at the ELS station um, and, and is first in line gets those tags. Um, if you do have military preference, then uh, definitely you just want to apply as is because that will give you a, a arm and a leg advantage above the normal applicants. Nice. Um, what is um, how do, how so Craig? You talked about this a little bit just in the talk. Mm -hmm. You know, um, how does the field dressing differ from a deer? You know, it uh, it it, it finds it sounds like there's more detail work involved, uh, especially with keeping those paws on. Um, so, could you just elaborate on that a little bit? Well, w with the field dressing, you want that incision to be nice and straight. And have you decided what you want to do with that bear? I, do you want to make a rug out of it? Do you want to have a three-quarter mount? Um, so by stopping your incision before the sternum, you've got more um, opportunity to, to deal what you want to deal with. But making that incision from the, the vent to the sternum um, is, is probably nice straight line is the key there. And as far as turning the paws, uh, there's a joint there in the wrist that you can stop skinning right there and, and cut the paw off and the taxidermist will go. There's some really good um, drawings out on the internet. And uh, the last bear that I rugged out for Andy, I, uh, I was really pleased with the way it came out because we laid it out on the ground and the paws were facing the right direction. It didn't have one paw that was bent up in the air and um, it'll make a nice looking rug. And that was, a real interesting bear to me. It was 29 years old, so that was that was pretty neat. Nice. Um, is there time to run the bear to a a locker or let it cool overnight um, for somebody who may not be um, inclined to hurt themselves? Yeah, not a meat cutter. You know, if if you're bear hunting, talk to your locker plants and see what kind of hours they're going to keep for bear season. Um, maybe they'll give you a private cell number that if you're a successful hunter and you don't get there until after closing hours, they can be on their way when you're on your way there. And most of them are, are pretty understanding with, with that. Nice. Uh, Andy, what tool is best for pulling the teeth and how many teeth do you need? Do you need one or do you need more? So we would prefer two just to, um, to prevent any uh, problems with aging. And so what you're pulling here is the, the first premolar on the uppers. And so behind the canines are the fang teeth. There are two small vestigial teeth. They don't use those for chewing um, and they're easiest to identify. And you wanna, um, uh, you can cut around the gum tissue a bit and then you just kinda wanna, I, um, you could either run a knife along them or you can pry them up with a screwdriver. But the, the main thing is that you, you want to get the full root. So not only if we the, if both roots are broken, we won't be able to get you an age for your bear patch. 
but we also won't be able to put that information in the population model. So we won't actually know what that bear was. So, um, yeah, I would just uh, bring your knife with you. You can cut as far down on the bone as you can, and you can either fry it up with a screwdriver or you can grab it with a pliers and just wiggle it out. They come out pretty sounds, easy. Sounds like it's a good idea to have a multi-tool with you in the field for with bear Always. hunting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Always. Um, our next question is, is there a typical range for bears located in a given area? Um, you know, so for instance, bears spotted in and around Anoka seem to roam quite far. What's the likelihood of encountering them if given access to properties they have passed through? It really kind of depends. Um, so I grew up in Oak Grove, and so I'm well familiar with this expanding bear population. Um, my dad works for the city of Anoka. Um, so if you're in those areas where bears range far um, or there's a low population of bears that you want to try to be along some sort of migration corridor so in anoka for example this means you want to be up and down the rum or the mississippi and they'll use those river corridors as travel travel venues um, in general a bear's home a male bear's home range in a given year is about about 100 square miles um and then a females is about 10 square miles and so um they really can be anywhere in that but within that home <laughs> in the fall they're going to target whatever has the highest calorie concentration they they really hit those um they don't like to waste time and so they're going to go for the highest amount of calories for the lowest amount of effort they possibly can nice um andy have have there been any bears that have been collared that did something totally uh, unexpected, weird, um, you know, in terms of their dispersal or, you know, they tried to den and somebody's under somebody's porch or like, what's what's kind of the most eyebrow raising behavior you've seen on some of these collared bears? Uh, long distance migrations are becoming, we're detecting those more because we have GPS collars now instead of radio collars. In the old days, they would just disappear and we wouldn't know where they go. Well, now we know where they go. And so we have a bear that goes from Grand Rapids to Brainerd and back every single year for the month of September. And so that's used to be eyebrow raising now is just the norm. Um, we've had bears that have gotten hit by cars that are fine. We've had bears that are shot with, with a broadhead and, and raised cubs with it embedded in their shoulder. Um, the, for example, I just had one of our collared bears at Voyagers National Park leave the park and come all the way almost to town in Grand Rapids. So um, it's just the, the we're learning new things every year that we have these collars out. Nice. nice. Um, we've got one more question in the Q and A, and and I've seen a couple of questions come up in the chat. I'm, I'm you know, my priority has been the Q and A because it's a lot easier to navigate. But um, if we've got some time, I'll get to those ones that are in the chat. Um, has has there been any discussion on multiple seasons for bears? You know, either in early fall, late fall, um, like we have with some of the other wildlife. Not that not that I've been aware of. There there hasn't necessarily been a, a push for such a thing um in general everybody's got their bear pretty much in the first two or three weeks of the season and is done and so the only folks out there late season are are ones that didn't get a bear early or are holding off for that big trophy bear okay i'm gonna move to some of the stuff that came up in the chat um so give me a second and for those of you that are still hanging on with us uh I've got a, like I said, this is, it's a little harder to see some of the stuff. Um, if I wanted to use my crossbow, may I also have my rifle slash shotgun with me during the hunt? And that might be a question to ask your local CO because I think it's gonna depend on um, what the circumstances are, whether you're el eligible to hunt with a crossbow to begin with, et cetera. So, um, Crossbows are legal during bear season. Um, it's not a specific archery only, so you can use the crossbow. Anybody could use a crossbow during the, the bear or turkey season. Okay. Um, and then Craig, remind us, uh, you know, there's a few things that you need to be aware of just in general when you're hunting. One of those are roadways and right-of-ways. 
um, how far off of a road do we need to be before we set up shop and, and um, go hunting? So my personal rule of thumb is to go in as far as I can. I get less interaction from people off of logging roads or um, county roads, uh, state highways. Just I, that's not a hunting experience to me. Getting back in the, the bush just a little bit deeper um, is it, more pleasurable, you know. And taking an ATV in on a, a logging road and finding some bear sign and then following that trail back in until I find a good spot for a bait site uh, is kind of what I'm looking for. And I, I'm not sure what the legal distance is, but I I would not set up at the minimum distance just because it's not going to be a a pleasurable hunt. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, I think, um, you know, shooting within the right of way is illegal and right. the right of way is frequently defined as ditch to ditch. Mm -hmm. um, so on either side of, of the road. Um, so be aware of where you're at. Um, also, while you're at it, be aware of homes and houses, you know, 500 feet within a house, it's illegal to mm -hmm. discharge a firearm. Uh, so be cognizant of that when you're out there in the woods. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think, um, getting further back, you, I've hunted with road noise in the background and I don't like it. Um, I'd, I'd much rather hear birds and, and the other critters that are in the woods. So. Yep. The one thing to be careful of is not getting too far off thinking bears have to be remote. I mean, bears live in town, bears live on the edge of town, bears live everywhere. And so Think about if you happen to shoot a four or 500 pound bear, how you're going to get it out of the woods quickly and get that meat cold. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're setting up shop. Yeah. That's really important. That's a great point. Um, I, there was one thing to clarify about the ELS, um, you know, station when you're there to line up to get first in line for those uh, open tags. Um, are there... I'm trying to understand the question. Are there open tags for three minutes due to the rush, or is it basically just within three minutes those open tags are gone? So it's within three minutes those open tags are gone. Anybody is eligible to purchase them, and I and they won't mess with your preference points at all. So um, if you don't get drawn, it's a good idea to still apply if you still want to hunt. Or I should say um, get to that uh, ELS station. But if you're second in line, I'd go find another one because your chances are much lower. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I'm seeing in the um, in the the chat and in the uh, the Q and A. So, oh, I got one more. There's one more little red question that popped up. Give me a second. Let me get down to it because we're coming down to the wire here. We're squeaking it in. Um, oh, it's just a thank you. So, thanks everybody. Um, I um, I want to thank Andy for taking the time to share his wealth of knowledge with us. I want to thank Craig for 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 being here to to help out. Um, great conversation, y'all. Really appreciate it. I learned some stuff. I hope I hope the folks on the call learned as well. Um, this again, this call is being recorded. We're going to post it where you registered for this event, um, and you at that site you can also find the previous events for this summer series. Um, keep an eye out. Our fall series is going to be advertised here coming up soon. We've got programs through the end of the year, so uh, there's going to be plenty of stuff to talk about as we come into um, come into fall because hunting season starts September 1st um, with morning doves. So we're we're coming up we're coming up into the busy season. So All thanks right. everybody for being here, Craig, Andy. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everybody for tuning in and um, get out there, have fun, enjoy yourselves, be safe.